Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 683 for March 4th, 2018. Coming up in a few minutes. We've been in sort of in a remarkable different journey over the past couple of years, really focusing on different species of oak. That's Donald O'Gallacore of Ireland's Glendalough Distillery. Of course, St. Patrick's Day is still a couple of weeks away, but this Saturday was declared Irish Whiskey Day. By who, we're not quite sure, but we never need an excuse to talk about Irish whiskey, and we'll do just that on this week's Whiskey Cast in Depth. I'll also talk with Bourbon and Beyond Festival promoter Danny Wimmer and Fred Minnick, who's curating the bourbons for the second edition of the Whiskey and Music Festival that's coming up this September in Louisville. I'll also have the calendar of events, this week's Your Voice, and the What I'm Tasting This Week department, all coming up on this week's Whiskey Cast. You don't need a special occasion to celebrate with something truly unique, but a personally engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label can make any occasion special. Support for Whiskey Cast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, no Redbreast. Let's get started with the week's news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. U.S. President Donald Trump stunned the business community and his staff Thursday with a surprise announcement that he plans to impose tariffs on imports of steel and aluminum as early as this coming week. We reported this year that the administration was considering tariffs as a way to protect the domestic steel industry, but that discussion had quieted down in recent months. The president's move could lead to a full-scale trade war, and the bourbon industry is likely to be one of the casualties. The European Union hinted last year that if the U.S. imposed tariffs on steel, it would retaliate with tariffs on bourbon exports to Europe, and EU officials repeated that stance this week. Not because bourbon and steel are of equal value, but you have to keep in mind that more than 90% of U.S. bourbon comes from Kentucky, which is the home state of Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. The Europeans would also hit Harley-Davidson motorcycles made in Wisconsin, the home state of House Speaker Paul Ryan. The European Union, Canada, China, and other trading partners who export steel to the U.S. are also threatening to go after other U.S. agricultural products as well. President Trump could sign an executive order imposing the tariffs as early as this coming week. We'll follow the story and keep you posted. Let's talk about whiskey imports for a second now, and what appears to be a regulatory issue that's blocking shipments of whiskeys ordered from some of the major online retailers. The Whiskey Exchange, Master of Malt, and other online retailers have been advising their U.S. customers in recent days that they're no longer able to ship to all but a handful of states. While U.S. law generally bans direct shipments of alcoholic beverages from overseas directly to individuals, the retailers are working within the law by sending packages through licensed customs brokers on the U.S. East Coast, which make sure that all of the taxes and fees are paid, before sending the orders on to the buyer, usually by FedEx. There have always been a few states that banned those shipments completely, but now FedEx is only allowing shipments to 10 states and the District of Columbia. That list includes California, New York, Oregon, and Virginia. Master of Malt Managing Director Tom McGinnis told me in an email this week that his company has not received an explanation for the sudden change. Quoting now, We're still speaking with our carriers to try to understand what's going on and whether there's a viable workaround. We do regularly see changes in shipping policies on a state-by-state basis, but never as broad a prohibition across so many states. Now, we have contacted FedEx for an explanation, but have not yet received a response. We'll update this story on WhiskeyCast.com as we get more information. 
There's one other bit of news this week involving whiskey and politics. Tennessee distillers are fighting the possibility of being taxed on their whiskey barrels. That's after a tax assessor in Moore County, Tennessee, decided for the first time that the barrels themselves should be considered as equipment and thus taxable business property instead of a non-taxable part of a distillery's inventory. Keep in mind that Moore County is home to the Jack Daniels Distillery and all of its warehouses, and that could mean millions of dollars in tax revenue for the county. If Moore County succeeds, it could make distillers statewide liable for property taxes on their barrel inventory. State lawmakers are considering legislation to clear up the issue once and for all and define barrels as non-taxable inventory. In other news, March is International Women's Month, and Diageo's Johnny Walker brand set off a big debate over equality this week with the introduction of the black label Jane Walker edition. Jane Walker is a fictional counterpart to the iconic striding man character that has been the Johnny Walker trademark for more than a century. But unlike previous whiskeys that have been targeted to women, the Jane Walker edition uses the traditional Johnny Walker black label recipe. Diageo plans to donate up to $250,000 from sales of the Jane Walker edition to women's groups, including Monumental Women, which is raising money to build statues of suffragette leaders Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton in New York City's Central Park. The arguments online this past week have ranged from those supporting the project enthusiastically to those who call it patronizing to women. So, to get an explanation of the thinking behind the Jane Walker edition, I talked with Stephanie Jacoby. She's the Vice President of U.S. Marketing for Johnny Walker. Let's talk first about the uh, the impetus for this. Where did the idea for the Jane Walker version come from, and how long have you been working on it? Johnny Walker, as you know, is a brand that stands for um, inspiring and celebrating progress. And, you know, Jane has been in the works uh, for a little while and an idea that we've been really excited about. And I think it's really been, um, you know, as the women's progress and the conversation around gender equality has become increasingly more important, um, I think we kind of crystallize this idea of introducing uh, a striding woman to go with our striding man. What was the research that uh, led to this? Because I'm assuming that there was some research done. Uh, No major brand does a uh, campaign like this without uh, doing some research into it. What did the research tell you that uh, suggested that this would would fly, for lack of a better term? I think it's less about research and more about... um, again, kind of being driven from a place of purpose and brand values. And we recognize that as a brand who's had an icon of a striding man for, you know, about a century, that as we think about icons and culture, there's this incredible opportunity to put more female icons in culture and just realize that with our icon, there was, you know, a great opportunity to participate in that because we strongly believe that, you know, you can't be what you can't see. Um, And right now, women are really underrepresented in that way. One of the things that I thought was most impressive about this, or at least not something that would be um, cause some controversy, is that you didn't create a special blend and tone it down a little bit. This is the same standard 12-year-old black label blend that we've seen for 100 years. In the bottle, it's not a uh, exactly. it's not a whiskey that was designed for women. It's a label that celebrates women, to, for lack of a better term. Exactly. I mean, this is Johnny Walker Black Label. It's an iconic, award winning whiskey, and you know, because taste buds have no gender. I have to ask though, there are actual women in the history of this brand that could have been celebrated as an icon. Uh, I'm thinking of Helen Cumming and Elizabeth Cumming from Cardew Distillery. Helen founded it. Elizabeth sold the distillery to John Walker back in the day, and that is the home place for Johnny Walker now. And then, of course, there's Elizabeth Walker, John Walker's wife, who gave birth to the sons of John Walker. But (laughs) more than that was his partner in founding the original company. Why not celebrate one of them with a real-life character, a real-life person, as opposed to 
a fictional character. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in, in concepting Jane, it was really important that Jane represents every woman as well as kind of the timelessness of Johnny Walker. And that's really why we chose to name her Jane. I think there's a lot that we're doing as a brand in both this launch and things outside of this launch to shine more of a light on both the authentic role women have played in both the history of Johnny Walker, as you mentioned, as well as shining a light on the fact that they play a hugely important role today. You know, half of our blenders are female. And I think with platforms like Blenders Batch, you know, showcasing um, Emma Walker and Amy Gibson, like th- there's just an opportunity and the brand is really excited to just do more and more of that. Because as you and I both know, women have played an incredibly important role in the history of whiskey, which I think um, surprises a lot of people. And there's just an opportunity for us to bring more attention to that. You sort of hinted that there's more coming along these lines. What can you tell us about how you plan to take this campaign, even though it's just only a week old? Where do you plan to take it from here besides the donations that are going to be made for the, uh, the statues in Central Park? Well, Jane will be an enduring part of the brand. So she will definitely live on beyond this because I think, you know, again, as a brand that's that's committed to progress and, you know, shining a light on the key communities we feel that are driving that, you will see a continued commitment to um, progress towards gender equality from the brand. Earlier this week, you were quoted as suggesting that Scotch might be seen as intimidating by some women. And that, that caused a bit of a a backlash. And I have to ask the question here, were you surprised by that? And are you surprised by some of the comments that have come out since the introduction of Jane Walker? Yeah. Yeah. I was quoted as saying that. I think a better way to have said it would have been that um, there's just so much to learn about whiskey and scotch. And that's what makes this category, I think, so exciting. You know, scotch is all about um, history and stories. And I think that you know, women are great storytellers and there's this great opportunity to kind of connect the two even more closely. Um, and I think in terms of the backlash, you know, I think anytime you do something this bold, being a brand as well recognized as Johnny Walker is, you know, it's going to get talked about and there's always going to be people that disagree. Let's talk about the charity end of it, though. You are donating some of the uh, proceeds from the sales of the Jane Walker edition to uh, the monumental women group that's uh, mm-hmm. working with uh, central park to try to uh, honor some women from history. Tell me about that project. So I first learned about monumental women. Actually, I was reading an article in the New York times called uh, why we should put more women on pedestals. And I think the article was so inspiring because it helped us really crystallize this idea of, we need to put more female icons out in the forefront of culture and that there was this really shared mission between what we were trying to do and what monumental women were trying to do. And as you know, they are uh, working to erect the first statue of women in Central Park in 2020. And just the fact that there's 23 statues in Central Park and not a single one is of a female is, is something that I think, um, you know, something we should really change. And I think we're really excited to champion that cause. And, you know, it really allows us to shine a light on and celebrate the role that women have played in history getting us to where we are. And then our other charity partner is is She Should Run, which is a nonpartisan organization, which is really about shaping the future and making sure that there's more female representation within our government to ensure that women are better represented going forward. Give me a sense of that representation within the Diageo workforce. I know that the company has won awards for its commitment to equality and Diageo North America is run by a woman, and you're running the Johnny Walker brand, and there is a significant diversity within the company. So let's sort of explain that, because we've never really talked about that. Absolutely, and it's it's something at Diageo that we're so proud of, and that the company is so committed to, and it's fantastic because we really walk the walk, and you know everything from the fact that our board is going to achieve gender parity in April to the fact that 40% of our executive team is female, you know, to the fact that you've already mentioned that um, the head of Diageo North America is a woman, our global CFO is a woman, our global CMO is a woman. 
Um, and then that, you know, goes right through the organization with uh, people, for example, my role leading Johnny Walker in the U.S., as well as um, the women on our blending team. So I think we're really well represented and Diageo has a huge commitment to that. The Jane Walker edition will only be available for a limited time in the U.S., though, as Stephanie Jacoby said, the image of Jane Walker will become a part of the long-term future of the Johnny Walker brand. And full disclosure, if you're not already aware of it, Johnny Walker is one of the presenting sponsors of WhiskeyCast, but as always, full editorial control over this story remains with WhiskeyCast. In other news this week, Whiskey Magazine announced the American winners of its World Whiskies Awards Tuesday night in New York City. Sazerac's 1792 Full Proof Bourbon won the world's best bourbon title, while Westland Distillery won the Best American Single Malt Award for last fall's Pete Week release. As you might recall, that one had three different sideshow-themed labels, Spinther, Mistress Miasma, and Finostris. But it's an upcoming Westland release that has people curious. Steve Urey posted a tweet last week of a Westland TTB label approval for a sport dram, which looks more like a label for a sports drink than it does a whiskey, along with the slogan, Be the Best, Crush the Rest. I caught up with Westland master distiller Matt Hoffman last Sunday at the Julio's Go Whiskey weekend near Boston and asked for an explanation. I don't know what you're talking about. It's the thing on the TTB website with the uh, blue and green label that has a big S in your Westland logo all over it. Uh, you know, it's, um, I, don't, I don't think I can talk about that right now. You know, just maybe wait in a few weeks and maybe we can talk more about it. So you guys haven't decided to switch to start making sports beverages instead of whiskey? Part of me wants to, to joke about that, but, but I also wanted to be very clear. No, we're making single malt whiskey. <laughs> so, um, no, you'll, um, you know, you'll see. We'll see. Okay, as soon as Matt's ready to talk, we'll have the details here on WhiskeyCast. In the meantime, the Virginia Distillery Company took home the Best American Blended Malt Award for its port cask-finished Virginia Highland Blended Malt. It's an unusual combination as the distillery's Ian Thomas explained. The whiskey itself is, and, and as all of our whiskeys are, um, they're the six-year import whiskey from Scotland. Um, we actually blend and marry that whiskey with our very own American single malt that we're producing at the distillery on site. That blend is then uh, filled into casks, a variety of casks. Um, for the winter here, we filled it into um, Virginia port-style casks. We filled it into traditional Oportos, Tawny, and Ruby Ports, and then we make our blends from those casks. And this is something that Jim Swan worked with you guys on, right? Jim Swan, um, funny enough, he wasn't the biggest fan of, of the uh, finishes, but Jim Swan uh, actually worked with us on our American single malt, which we are blending into the six year. Um, but Jim Swan was actually very, very involved with um, the, the distillery operations, so everything from fine-tuning our mashing. Um, uh, I worked with Dr. Swan on our warehousing operations and really looking at um, studying our climate and the effects of how that can um, really change and, and develop uh, our whiskey and, and cask. Um, he worked with us uh, on quality control. He worked with us on a variety of things, but uh, I guess, in, yeah, in, in, in a sense he did. He helped us work with, uh, with this whiskey as well. And one other award from the other night, Balconis Distillery won the Best American Single Cask Single Malt Award for its French Oak Single Cask released last July. I'll be in Waco next time around for the Balconis Rye Fest weekend. We'll have more on this whiskey then. Except for the world's best bourbon winner, the other U.S. winners will go up against their competitors from around the world, with the winners to be announced later this month on the eve of Whiskey Live in London. Back at the end of December, during episode 674, we heard from James Buddy Thompson about the rare 45-year-old Final Reserve edition of the James Thompson and Brother Bourbon. It's one of the few remaining whiskeys from the original Glenmore Distillery in Owensboro, Kentucky. Each contain a 750 milliliter decanter, a 100 milliliter bottle of tasting. So you can have a taste of what the, of the product without having to open the decanter. 
uh, right away. I think people are going to want to save those probably. Uh, a piece of a barrel, a snifter for tasting purposes, and uh, a brochure that describes the whole process and tells a little bit of the history of the company. And that's about it. The first two uh, bottles, the first two boxes, have already been presented to the Congressional Medal of Honor Foundation. And um, I don't think I could have found a better starting place for this kind of program to, to try to do things for veterans. Here's an update. The gift sets went on sale Thursday at Louisville's Fraser History Museum at $1,800 each. They sold out in less than two hours. 90% of the profits will be donated to veterans groups, while the rest will go to the Fraser History Museum. New whiskeys unveiled this week. Luxco is out with the 2018 edition of its Rebel Yell single barrel bourbon. It's a 10-year-old bourbon bottled at 50% ABV and will sell for around $60 a bottle. Barrel Whiskey is about to release a most unusual whiskey. You may have seen so-called living casks in the past at some retailers in Scotland, where casks in a store were occasionally topped up with different whiskeys from time to time to create a unique blend that changed over time, hence the name living cask. The regulatory environment in Scotland eventually ended a lot of those projects, but now barrel founder Joe Beatrice is about to release what he calls the Infinite Barrel Project. We started with a couple of thousand gallons of whiskeys from around the world and the United States. And as we bottle it, we're going to take out product and then add more whiskeys to it. And it's going to be an ongoing, continuous, infinite barrel of whiskey. Sort of like a modified Solera process? It's a modified Solera process, exactly. The first bottling contains Tennessee whiskey and rye, along with whiskey from Indiana finished in Oloroso sherry butts, Indiana rye, a Polish malted rye whiskey finished in Curacao barrels, and whiskeys from Scotland and Ireland. It'll be out in retailers in a couple of weeks, but I have a sample of it, and I'll have my tasting notes for it later on. Last October, I reported on Irish distillers' plans to start making single casks of Middleton Very Rare whiskey available for sale to collectors and the hospitality industry. We got word this week of the first cask that will be available to the public. Ireland's Ashford Castle Hotel in County Mayo acquired a vintage virgin American oak barrel filled with pot still whiskey from Middleton. It's been bottled in bespoke Waterford Crystal decanters, and will be available exclusively at the Ashford Castle. No word on pricing. The U.S. is getting an exclusive Amrut single cask bottling, along with what's becoming a very rare find, a single cask bottling of the Czech distilled Hammerhead single malt that we first reported on back in 2010. Raj Saberwal of Glass Revolution Imports is the U.S. importer for both brands. It was really hard to get. You know, as you know, the demand mark for Amrut is is you know incredible, and trying to convince them to give uh, give us a single cask was tough. Even though we're one of the largest export markets for Amrut, we actually will have a second single cask coming in September. What can you tell me about that one? It will probably be sherry Oloroso sherry aged. As you may know, that we're Amrut's, we're going to be launching new bottles and new packaging for Amrut for the whole line in September, and we're going to do a cross-country tour. Um, and to commemorate that, we will have this single cask available. And while I've got you here, we got to talk about this, the, finally, the arrival of uh, Hammerhead. Yes, um, and, and thanks to you for the lead on that. You know, it was interesting going through dealing with the people in, in the Czech Republic or in Czech to try and get this and the biggest challenge was convincing them that I wanted it not chill filtered and I wanted a cast strength and uh, I was given four samples I think and the one we selected is actually a 28 year old single malt uh, Czech barley, Czech oak, a little bit of Czech peat, really interesting whiskey. Uh, you know, it was forgotten about for 20 some odd years because it was only made 
during the communist regime and only actually from 89 to 90, so a very short period of time that this whiskey was actually made. Uh, we're still trying to figure out how many casts they actually have, uh, because if this one does well, I actually would like to bring a few more in. And they don't have a whole lot of this left, do they? They don't. They are, uh, you know, like I said, they don't know exactly what they have. Uh, most of what they've sold over the last few years, they've been vatting, bringing down to 40%, uh, you know, all the things that I don't like. <laughs> I like to have cast strength stuff. I like to have things non-chill filtered. By way of full disclosure, a couple of years ago, a Stock Spirits executive asked me if I could suggest some U.S. importers they might be able to work with. Raj was one of several I suggested they talk to, but I never heard anything more about it until Raj told me about this single cask bottling. And other than a sample bottle, I received no compensation from either side. I'll have my tasting notes for the Hammerhead and that Omrit single cask soon at whiskeycast.com. And finally, last July, during episode 652, we met the licorice family of Iron Root Republic Distillery in Denison, Texas. Robert and Jonathan Licorice handle the distilling, while their mother, Marcia, runs the front office. Marcia had a big birthday recently, and while her sons are well past that age when kids make birthday presents for their moms in school, Robert told me the other night that when you make whiskey for a living, why not? We've been working with Mansion at Turtle Creek down in Dallas, which is one of the uh, classic restaurants and bars in Dallas. And they selected our very first single barrel of our Huber's Corn Whiskey and got released on my mom's 65th birthday. So it was a tribute to her and a tribute to Dallas, which was pretty exciting. So, What did she say when she found out that what you guys had done for her birthday? She uh, most excited I've ever seen her be. Uh, Almost excited when the when my brother's kids were born. So it's almost like another grandchild, I think. So she loves that barrel more than anything. And she's going to kill you for telling the world that she's 65 now. I didn't say, I, I don't remember saying that. And a very happy birthday, Marsha. You can keep up with the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Highland Park. Need a touch of Orkney when you're out on the road? Of course, Highland Park is not an option when you're driving, but if you have Spotify on your smartphone, open it up and listen to one of Highland Park's specially curated playlists. When you get home, then you can pour that dram of Highland Park. It's the Orkney Single Malt with Viking Soul. Find out more at highlandparkwhiskey.com. Redbreast fans have always cherished our whiskey's sherry notes, so we set out to embellish that character. Introducing the Redbreastless Stow Edition a quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey finished in first fill Oloroso sherry casks from Spain's prestigious Bodegas Listeo. Carrying Redbreast trademark pot still spices and dark dried fruit notes, the Listeo edition is graced with an enduring sherry finish that would be better described as a final act. Discover the newest branch on the Redbreast family tree. Let's open up the inbox now for this week's Your Voice, brought to you by Lot 40. I mentioned last time around that I'd shipped out a bunch, and I do mean a bunch, of Glencairn glasses last week, the winners of our various contests over the last couple of months. James Otter from the UK, at Jotterface on Twitter, was a winner in our 12K giveaway in December when we hit 12,000 followers on Twitter, and he tweeted at the time that his shelves might not be able to take the weight of one more Glencairn. Well, this week he tweeted a photo of his brand new whiskey cast, Glen Cairn, and this. Mark, you are a legend. My wife, however, parentheses, hater of all things Glen Cairn shaped, now must add you to her list. And he added a skull emoji. I can live with that. I've been on more than a few lists over the years. Of course, guns have been in the news a lot lately, and there's been a lot of conversation about guns on social media. We're not going to get into that, but I did see this tweet from at History in Flicks the other night. AR-15 stands for the actually Rifle 15, because anytime you get some inconsequential fact wrong about it, 15 idiots will appear out of thin air to actually you with some boring nonsense about their stupid gun. Now, I've got to be really honest here. There are whiskey people who do the same thing, and I'll admit I'm one of them. 
though I do try to do it only to people who should know better, such as those people who write stories about whiskeys. And Jason Hauser, at Whiskey Slayer on Twitter, confessed to it as well in this tweet. The correction of the mispronunciation of Isla is one of my major pet peeves. Can't bring myself to not correct them. So what's the one thing about whiskey that you see on social media that sets you off? Share it with us this week on Twitter and at our Facebook page. Here's one thing that happened this week that really set me off. The other night at Whiskey Live in New York, I interviewed some of the Australian distillers that made the long trip to New York City. We'll hear from them on next week's show, but I wanted to pass this along now. John Rockford of the McLaren Vale Distillery brought along several bottles of his Bloodstone Collection single cask single malts that are made in collaboration with a few of South Australia's leading wineries. While he was talking with someone at his stand the other night, another person came up and swiped his last full bottle of Bloodstone off the table into a bag and then took off before John could notice. I mentioned it that night on Twitter, and Brandy at BrandZ77 tweeted this. Wow, what an... Insert a double cussing emoji here. Hope he drops it so he won't be able to drink it. And from at New Bourbon Drinker, Wow, that's terrible. Hope it broke in his pocket on the way home. Now, I really hope the jerk who did that is not a Whiskey Cast listener. But if you are, and you know who you are, I hope you're ashamed of yourself. That's the kind of behavior that drives people and brands away from whiskey shows. And to be honest, stunts like that could lead to whiskey shows putting a complete ban on briefcases and bags. To be honest, that could affect our coverage of whiskey shows in the future. If you've ever seen me at a whiskey show, you know I carry a big messenger bag full of audio and camera gear. And if I have to be limited to the gear that I can carry in my hands, it's going to have a real impact on my ability to cover a show. So, if you're at a whiskey show, and you see someone sneaking a bottle off of a table, tell someone. We'll all be better off. And if you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always post it on the Your Voice page at whiskeycast.com. Of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. And my email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. This week's Your Voice is brought to you by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Time now for the WhiskeyCast calendar of events. Bonhams has its next whiskey auction this Wednesday in Edinburgh, Scotland. The New Orleans Bourbon Festival is this coming weekend, the 8th through the 10th. Whiskey Live Tel Aviv is March 14th and 15th in Tel Aviv, Israel. And the Whiskey Jubilee is March 15th in Seattle, along with the Whiskey Classic in Morristown, New Jersey. The Midlands Whiskey Festival is March 16th and 17th in Stourbridge, England. Whiskies of the World is March 22nd in San Jose, California, followed by Whiskies of the World up the freeway in San Francisco on the 24th. Whiskey Fest Chicago is on March 23rd, Whiskey Live London on the 23rd and 24th, and the Whiskey Festival Nord Nederland is the 23rd through the 25th in Groningen, the Netherlands. I'll be in Cornwall, Ontario that weekend for the wonderful World of Whiskey show at the NAV Center. And the Nth, the Ultimate Whiskey Experience, is April 4th through the 7th in Las Vegas. Right now, we have 195 different events on our searchable calendar at WhiskeyCast.com. Just click on the search button to find an event near you or wherever you might be traveling. Of course, if you have a festival or a tasting coming up that you'd like to let whiskey lovers know about, please use the contact form on our website and let us know about it. You don't need a special occasion to open a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label. But when you have a special occasion, why not celebrate with a specially engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label? Here's how one whiskey lover celebrated his team's recent success. He arranged to have 108 specially engraved bottles of Johnny Walker Blue Label made for his co-workers. You might say he hit a home run. 
just like the perfectly executed double play. Johnny Walker, blue label is smooth and well-rounded, and unlike a trophy, never needs polishing. Support for Whiskey Cast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. Johnny Walker Blue Label Blended Scotch Whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast In Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin. In just a few minutes, we'll talk to some entrepreneurs betting on Irish whiskey's future. But first, Louisville's Champions Park played host to the inaugural Bourbon and Beyond Festival last September with music from Stevie Nicks, the Steve Miller Band, Gary Clark Jr., Buddy Guy, and many more musicians, along with world-class chefs and, of course, many of Kentucky's best bourbons. The event was so successful that promoter Danny Wimmer recently signed a 10-year contract for Bourbon and Beyond with the city of Louisville. This week, Danny and Fred Minnick unveiled the bourbon lineup for this September's edition of Bourbon and Beyond. Now, if you've listened to Whiskey Cast over the years, you know about Fred's bourbon writing. But Danny Wimmer is a longtime concert promoter and music industry executive who never does interviews. In fact, one of his colleagues was dumbfounded when Danny and Fred started talking with me the other night at Whiskey Live New York. But here's the thing. You start talking to someone with a passion for bourbon, and they open right up. Well, we're excited. Uh, we just announced our bourbons today. Um, we felt like it was appropriate to announce the bourbons first. Uh, you know, it's just truly a bourbon festival. The music was always really meant to complement the bourbon selection and as long with the, the chefs that we're about to announce in April. But it's really about the bourbon. So um, you know, we're really excited to you know, show the world uh, what we're about to announce along with the bourbons. Fred, tell me about the bourbons because you guys went over and above this year. Yeah, basically we tried really hard to make this special for bourbon lovers. So we've got the rare stuff like Rock Hill Farms, uh, Pappy Van Winkle. We're going to have some of the rare, you know, Michter's stuff there at our Hunter's Bar, which is going to be operated by Silver Dollar, the popular Louisville restaurant. Uh, we also going to have some really cool, what we call like activations for, with, with food and the bourbon. Uh, at my mini bar, we're having a special uh, kind of section for, for the craft brands. And that's to kind of call them out to let them get some really nice attention. You know, hopefully someone comes by there and finds a brand like MB Roland and says, I want to go to the store and I, I want to buy that. And that becomes like a regular and it, it helps helps them learn more about some of the great, you know, Kentucky craft brands that are there. When do we get to hear about the music for this year? We're going to be announcing in mid-April. We got some uh, good things brewing right now. Um, you know, this is really about craft. And the one thing that I love about bourbon is its patience. It's, it's a true art form. And when I'm, when I'm, Picking the artist, I kind of imagine sipping on bourbon and listening to the music. Um, if you looked at the lineup from last year, everybody, the whole thing's about craftsmanship. From you know how the chefs compliment with Tom Clicchio, that's an art form. Uh, the chefs where they're going now, it's just such an art. Um, with the artists we pick, from Stevie Nicks to Gary Clark Jr., it's just these are like true artists, and that's really what this festival is about complimenting what the master distillers are doing. Is there a chance we could see this go on the road into multiple cities over time? Well, that's funny you ask that. You know, we're working on something in Santa Barbara right now. Something a little smaller, but more highlighting, less music, more like a, a little more, it, it'll have a music piece to it, but I want it to be more bourbon chef less less music smaller you know three to five thousand people i want the master distiller really to get to touch every person when i was at um a distillery a couple weeks ago and i got the one-on-one -on -one with the master distiller most 99.9 percent .9 of the people don't understand what they're tasting 
and there's a great, it, it, it was an unbelievable experience when I got there and I was tasting and he was helping me take my palate and, 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 and my brain was saying all these different things, but he helped me identify what I was tasting. And I really want to create a platform for master distillers and people, and people who are just getting in the bourbon industry or just getting into bourbon. I want to create a touch point that they really can be educated. So I'm thinking about doing those type of boutique type festivals, something that, a, that the bourbons really can touch the people and help educate. I mean, that's a big reason why I, I believe in their vision and I believe in what they do. Um, you know, you've known me for a long time and I've been, I've been this kind of independent kind of guy just out there writing and, and doing my, my own thing. And this is, um, you know, Danny Wimmer calls me and says, hey, we, we got this festival um, that we're doing. And oh, by the way, if you'd like to uh, come backstage Metallica with me in, uh, <laughs> in Columbus, uh, you know, come over. So they, they <laughs> Fred, Fred's job, we, we brought, we asked Fred to help us curate the bourbon selection. You know, I'm a big bourbon drinker and we're based out of Los Angeles and here we are coming to Louisville, right? And uh, we brought Fred on to make sure to keep us, that we're, we're doing, keep, he's keeping us in line in a lot of ways and, and he's really helping us educate us, making sure we're staying true. Uh, not that, that we wouldn't have without him, but he really is the gatekeeper of making sure we're always keeping the master stiller's integrity first and foremost for the festival. And he's done such a great job helping us bridge the gap between us and the other bourbons. And he's, he's played such a key role in, in the way he's put the panels together, the way he's creating different conversations. He's really just helped us make this an incredible event. So I guess I have to ask, since you brought up Metallica, we had the news that we broke this week on, this, on the last episode with Dave Pickerel signing a deal to work with Metallica on not only a whiskey but a distillery. Any thoughts on this? Well, it's always exciting. We're, listen, we're whiskey fans. Uh, we're not sure. I don't know much more about about the what they're doing. If, if, is it a American whiskey? Is it Canadian? We just want people drinking whiskey, to be honest. And, uh, you know, for Bourbon and Beyond, it's a bourbon festival. But we're also, you know, we're fans of just whiskey. I mean, we're here, this great event, and there's Irish whiskey here. There's all kinds of types of whiskey. So... You know, we're, we're excited that a BAM at their level can really help, can really turn a fringe drinker into a full-time whiskey drinker, you know. Uh, and with their platform, they have a huge reach. Um, I think it's going to be exciting for, 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 whiskey, for whiskey business. Fred? Now, one of the things that I love about where this is going is like, you know, in, in, the, in our world, we always said that bourbons uh, were the are. Uh, the master sealers were rock stars. Well, now they're actually getting billing over or with rock stars with these guys, and that's what's exciting. The 2018 edition of Bourbon and Beyond is set for September 22nd and 23rd at Champions Park in Louisville. It's the weekend after the Kentucky Bourbon Festival in Bardstown. And there's a link for more details in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. For the last several years, Irish whiskey has been the fastest growing segment of the whiskey business worldwide, and that has led to a boom in new brands and distilleries. A couple of weeks ago, we heard from Daryl McCarthy, who's leading the construction of the Dublin Liberties Distillery for quintessential brands, and blended the new Dead Rabbit Irish whiskey. There are many other people, though, who are staking their futures on the continued growth of Irish whiskey such as Danny Walsh of Boston. His family owns Three Hearts of Ireland, and they partnered with Ireland's Malcolm Brown Limited to create the Flaming Leprechaun whiskey brand. Different take on Irish spirits, captures the uh, fun-loving spirit of the Irish pubs, but maintains that real high quality of Irish distilling. Tell me how a local company here in Massachusetts pulls it together to create an Irish whiskey brand works the contacts in Ireland to get the juice and makes it happen from scratch. You know, it's actually a really funny story. It is a very long story, but my dad was actually in waste consulting, went over to uh, Ireland to do some uh, consulting for Diageo Guinness factory. 
looking at their barley disposal. From there, he kind of got into um, looking at all green powering of distilleries. From there, he met our Irish guys, and they bought up the first batch of inventory about nine years now. So that's uh, kind of how it snowballed from there. Yep. And then how did you create the Flaming Leprechaun brand? Yeah, so that's our Irish partners really wanted to do the, the Flaming Leprechaun. They actually thought it would be nice to have uh, the mystical um, story of Ireland because it is such a big part of their, their storied history. So they want to tie that instead of just calling it Walsh's Whiskey and being another one of those similar brandings on Irish uh, spirits. They want to do a little something more fun. And there's already a Walsh whiskey company in yes, Ireland, yeah, so uh, yeah. that wouldn't really work, would it? They beat us to it, yeah. There's a lot of Walshes out there, you know. It's a pretty common name, so. Tell me about the uh, fun and games on this end and getting distribution for a small company like yours to uh, get out into the market and make this thing work. Yeah, so that was a big hurdle for us. So getting the initial distributor uh, was the hardest part, but now we're doing really well in the marketplace. So using that to uh, kind of jump into other states as a hero card, it's a lot easier, but the initial distribution was tough. It took us about four months to kind of lock down, really grinding it out, um, leveraging a bunch of different distributors, but we're really happy with our partnership with Martinetti in Massachusetts. Where do you hope to take this brand, especially given that Irish whiskey is the fastest growing segment of the whiskey market, and you guys are a relatively small player in it? Yeah, I mean, we have a, just a small piece of the pie, but it's a it's a rapidly growing but rapidly diversifying too. So these expressions are really unique to Irish spirits. That's our whole uh, concept and the sky's the limit. But people, once people try these, they, they love them. They're producing a traditional blended Irish whiskey along with a cinnamon flavored version and gin, rum, and vodka as well. Glendalough Distillery is often considered Ireland's first craft distillery of the modern era. It opened several years ago and has been laying down spirit while bottling older whiskeys sourced from other distilleries. I mentioned Glendalock during the news three weeks ago after the distillery revamped its range of whiskeys, and one of those new whiskeys is extremely unusual. It's a 13-year-old single malt finished in Japanese Mizunara oak casks. I talked with Glendalock co-founder Donna Logalacor this week, and that's where we started the conversation. How the hell did you guys get Mizanara casks? So we've been in sort of in a remarkable different journey over the past couple of years, really focusing on different species of oak, uh, really working with very small producers to source very rare priced casks. And we managed to get connected with the only independent cooperage in Japan. About 14 people worked there, and the oldest cooper, um, in Japan, the oldest cooper in Japan actually makes these casts for us, virgin Mizunara cast. And we were just, um, we were very interested in the density of the wood and really what it could do to Irish whiskey and never been done before. And as Ireland's first craft distillery, we want to keep on um, pushing the category forward, pushing what Irish whiskey can be forward. So we managed to make that connection and we wanted to age our favorite whiskey, which is our 13 year old single malt, which was voted best Irish whiskey in the world. We want to bring that to new depths. So we put it in a Mizanara cask. So we've now finish that between uh, between nine and 12 months in it and it just drops this sandalwood almost coconut a lot of vanilla and this honeycomb through it and it changes the whiskey entirely it's a completely remarkably different Irish whiskey where is it available it's actually just been launched in Massachusetts Connecticut Rhode Island New York New Jersey uh, Chicago, so Illinois and Georgia, so a handful of states uh, across the US, but also in 33 countries that we operate in. How's the distillery coming along, your second one? Because you started out with a small one, and you've already decided to expand, haven't you? So our small distillery has been expanding, so we've actually um, we've actually bought new equipment, so we've, we've doubled our capacity there. Uh, while we've uh, purchased our site right next to Glendalough, right on the way in Laren, County Wicklow, uh, where I'm from is Wicklow as well, so definitely definitely local boy done good, I hope anyway. Uh, and everything's m moving along in that, in, in that process, so we're, we're extremely happy with it. So you'll hear some announcements uh, from us, uh, hopefully before the the end of the year. I'll have my tasting notes for that Mizanara cask finished Glendalock in a few minutes. 
Now, in addition to the updates at Glendalough, there are distilleries under construction all over the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, reflecting the demand for Irish whiskey worldwide. Lockery Distillery has not received much attention until now, but founder Peter Clancy and his team showed up in New York at Whiskey Live, even though they don't have a drop of whiskey yet. We've stayed below the radar, but now we're, uh, we're, we're coming up for air. So we're in construction. Um, we're, a, we're an independent um, new Irish distillery in our hometown of Lanesworth, County Longford, right on the River Shannon. So we're, we're at the very top of Loch Ree, hence the name Loch Ree. So we're going to be built by the end of the year. We're going to be make, uh, laying down our first stock around this time next year, so once we're commissioned. What's your plan, sir? Are you going to make pot still? Are you going to make regular grain? What are you going to do? No, we're going to make single pot, pot still uh, Irish whiskey. So uh, I, I suppose you know we're, we're targeting, targeting at the uh, premium end of the market. You know, I suppose listen, that's that's the whiskey that we love, and that's where we, you know, we see a growth trend for Irish whiskey. So we're we're a small player. We got to, um, I suppose, pick a niche, and that's that, that's the one we're picking. Given the fact that Irish whiskey is booming and we're seeing distilleries built all over the island, are you coming in at the tail end of this or are you hoping it's still for early in the growth period? No, we believe it's it's early in the growth period. The projections from Board Beer, who are the state agency charged with, with exports, are uh, that Irish whiskey is going to triple um, between now and 2030. Yeah, sure, there's, there's quite a few distilleries, but there's, there's 18 at last count open. Uh, there's about another dozen in, in various stages like ours, okay? You compare that to Scotland. Last time I looked, there was 123 operating distilleries in Scotland. So we still got a way to go. Uh, and, and, you know, we're in the, the, the category, I suppose, what's been the fastest growing category for uh, the last dozen years plus. So, you know, at the scale we're talking about, uh, we're confident there's still space for guys like us. Are you worried at all about the new public health alcohol bill that the Dow is considering that could uh, make it hard for you guys to even advertise a visitor's center? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, there's, a, there's a bit of a conflict there because the same guys who, who uh, well, not, not the same guys, pardon me, uh, there's also another bill going through the Dow at the moment called the Craft Drinks Bill, right, which allows uh, distilleries and breweries to sell their own products uh, on premise, right? So you then have the public health alcohol bill coming in, which re restricts some of the things that they've just, they're just trying to provide in the other one. It's, it's got a way to go, to be honest. Um, the industry is, is, uh, believes it needs more balance. Uh, there's, there's certain elements of it which are, uh, you know, would be quite restrictive, I think, not, not just to us, but to, uh, to the industry as a whole. I mean, there's, there's stuff there about cancer labeling and that kind of stuff, which, you know, uh, it nearly puts us at a, a competitive disadvantage uh, as a category to, to, to the other players in the market. So, you know, that, that seems like a retrograde step. Um, it was debated in the Dáil uh, the week before last, and, you know, a, a straw poll, I would say, it was, it was uh, two to one uh, in favour of making some amendments to the bill, which would be more friendly, I suppose, to the producers. Even though the uh, Taoiseach has said he's not going to accept uh, any more amendments to this thing. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure about that. I mean, the Taoiseach is um, it's a minority government in Ireland, uh, supported by, by another large party, and also with the support of a lot of independents. So, you know, uh, the Taoiseach is a politician at the end of the day, and, and if, uh, if, if enough of, uh, of the guys who he's relying on votes from um, are, uh, would like to see some form of amendment to it, then you know, I think the Taoiseach is, is uh, a fairly astute guy. In addition to that public health alcohol bill, there's a much larger issue at stake that could affect the Irish whiskey industry, Brexit. After Great Britain leaves the European Union in March of next year, the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland will be the only land border between Britain and the single European market. Right now, people and goods move freely between the two countries, but if a hard border is put into place, that could affect shipments of raw materials and finished goods from distillers in Northern Ireland to the Republic's 20 counties, and vice versa. Proposals to put the hard border in place between the British mainland and Northern Ireland 
have been strongly opposed by Northern Ireland's Democratic Unionist Party. Its ten members in Parliament are propping up Prime Minister Theresa May's minority government. The Good Friday Agreement of 1988 largely ended the violence between paramilitary groups on both sides in Northern Ireland, and that agreement depends on a lot of cross-border cooperation with a healthy reliance on the two countries having equal status within the European Union and their citizens having free movement thanks to common EU citizenship. One can see why there's a lot of concern over the future of that border. That's this week's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Lagavulin, the legendary Isla single malt. Look for the Lagavulin 16 year old, the distiller's edition, and the new 8 year old Lagavulin at a whiskey shop near you. And get the story behind these unique whiskeys at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Let's start off with the Glendalock 13-year-old Mizunara cask finish we heard about a few minutes ago. It's bottled at 46% ABV, and the nose is fresh and fruity with notes of apricots, red apples, peaches, and honey. The taste has a good balance of fruit and spices with hints of cinnamon and ginger, apples, apricots, honey, and touches of coconut and vanilla. The finish... It's long and vibrant with a good balance of fruit and spices. I'm scoring the Glendalock Mizunara Cask Finish Irish Single Malt a 92. Turning now to another Irish Single Malt, this one is a joint bottling between the Whiskey Agency and the Whiskey Exchange. It's a 27-year-old 1990 Irish Single Malt from an undisclosed distillery that's bottled at 51.3% ABV. The nose has notes of apples, dried peaches, orange peel, honey, and vanilla. The taste is nicely balanced with orange peel, peaches, honey, and fresh berries that are complemented by touches of clove and ginger. The finish is long and slightly dry with lingering touches of orange peel, honey, and subtle spices. I'm scoring this one an 89. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, who is proud to announce the release of a series of Old Fitzgerald Bottled in Bond bourbons. Bottled in an ornate decanter inspired by a 1950s original, it carries on the legacy of John E. Fitzgerald and his act of larceny. Learn more at blog.heavenhilldistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. During the news, barrel whiskey's Joe Beatrice told us about his Infinite Barrel Project blend of seven different whiskeys from around the world. The debut edition is bottled at 59.65% ABV, and the nose is complex and spicy with notes of dried fruits, charred oak, vanilla, honey, and roasted almonds. The taste is thick, spicy, and intense with clove, cinnamon, and allspice notes balanced by honey, vanilla, and oak tannins. The finish is very long, warm, and smooth with lingering spices. It's an interesting concept and very well executed. I'm scoring the Infinite Barrel Project a 91. Finally, let's take a look at the 1987 Laphroaig 30-year-old single cask bottled by Douglas Lang & Company for its Extra Old Particular range. This one was a refill hogshead cask that was bottled last year at 53.5% ABV. The nose is classic Lefroy, phenolic and medicinal, with touches of band-aids and bacitracin, heather, honey, vanilla, driftwood smoke, and a hint of brine. The taste reminds me of sweet and smoky barbecue sauce with great peat and honey notes, vanilla, honey, and a touch of brine. The finish, well, it's just what you'd expect, long and smoky. This one is a classic, and I'm scoring the 1987 Lefroy 30-year-old from Douglas Lang & Company's Extra Old Particular range, a 93. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of nearly 2,100 different whiskeys at whiskeycast.com. Of course, that's also where you'll find links for the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast and our Whiskey Cast HD video episodes. 
links for the stories and the whiskeys we've talked about in this week's episode, and the latest whiskey news, events, and a whole lot more, including a complete archive of past episodes. I really want to thank everyone who has posted reviews and ratings for WhiskeyCast at iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and other podcast directories over the past few weeks. Now, when you do that, you really do make it easier for other whiskey lovers to find the show when they're looking for new content. We'll keep that cask strength conversation going all week long online. You can connect with me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. If you're not into social media, my email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. WhiskeyCast, brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. You don't need a special occasion to celebrate with something truly unique. But a personally engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label can make any occasion special. Support for WhiskeyCast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. WhiskeyCast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2018, and comes to you each week from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.